If you guys would stand, we're gonna worship together. We're gonna sing about this song, the song that's about how God stands with us through everything. Through good days and bad. Before we start, if everybody would close their eyes. Just take a moment to fix our eyes on, on God. Take a moment before we start singing to the one that's created us, the one that loves us, the one that's begging for us to sing to him. Let's sing this together. Savior 
And you lifted me up And you lifted me Let us believe that. Now there's nothing that can come between us. Nothing can take away the love you have for us. God, God, tonight would you would you give us a desperation for you? We love you, Lord. Amen. What's up? All right, everybody stand up real quick. Yeah, stretch, wake up, get, get zoned back in. Thank you, Harrison. How are y'all? Good. All right, have a seat. Everybody feel good? Good. Good. Hey, I'm happy, I'm happy you're here tonight. I'm happy to be here tonight. 
We're in week three of our series, Be Different. The chairs are a little different, right? Um, they're gonna stay this way Sunday. Um, this is the vision of Pastor Brandon Sloan um, so that, that we have more aisles within the church. I love it. Um, week three of Be Different. So the first week we talked about Jesus and how he did what? He called his first disciples. He performed miracles. He went on preaching in the synagogues and he performed miracles and he cast out demons and he did all these things. And it was really cool. And that all of that passage of scripture was pointing to one thing and that's the authority of Christ. And then last week, we talked about worry, right? We talked about how the Christian does not have to worry because they're a child of God. But when you do worry, there's good news. What's the good news? Jesus is your Savior, but he, he, what does he do on your behalf? He advocates for you on your behalf. He's your advocator. He stood in your place. He stands in your place. So he sustains. And tonight, tonight we're gonna dive into 1 John chapter 2, three verses. But before we go there, before we go to 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, Side note, 1 John is probably the greatest book of the Bible when it comes to assurance of faith, assurance of who God is and his power to save you. It's also a litmus test. So if you're reading it and you're convicted, I would, I would, uh, I would encourage you to lean into that, okay? Lean into that, all right. So, but before we dive into 1 John, I think it's really important that we look at 2 Timothy Chapter three, verses 16 through 17. You don't have to turn there. I want you to write it down. I'd like for you to go back and read it later tonight. It'll be on the screen. Um, 2 Timothy chapter three, verses 16 through 17. Really important for the Christian in the room, for the follower of Jesus Christ. This passage of scripture, it would be very wise of you to memorize this. My first class in college, the very first assignment I was given was to memorize this scripture. Of all the scriptures in all the Bible, it was this one that we were given to memorize. All scripture, all of it, in its entirety, from, from Genesis to Revelation, all scripture is breathed out, meaning that it is God's word. He spoke it through prophets and apostles who wrote this down, it is God's word. It's all breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, that the man or the woman or the student or the child or whatever of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Like this is it, okay? If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and you live here in America where we don't face persecution like in Nepal and where we do have access to Bibles on our phone, I got like four different versions and 20 different Bibles in my office, like, like everyone has a Bible. If you don't have a Bible tonight, I'll give you mine. I'll give you mine with all its notes. I'll give you my Bible, I'll go get another one. I'll go buy you a Bible, but we have a Bible. And God has revealed everything we need to know about him in his word, everything that we need to know. Every single attribute of God is found in his word. And in countries and places overseas where, where this is illegal to have, God's revealing himself to people in other ways, through visions, through dreams, and he can absolutely still do that here. He's God, he can do whatever he wants. But what I'm telling you is that if you have this, you have all of the scripture that was breathed out by God. And it would be very beneficial for you as a follower of Christ to feast on it, to take it in. In the context of 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, the reason that this matters for 1 John chapter two is this, is that Timothy, or Paul is writing, and, and, and the context of, of these two verses before and after it are this. He's writing to encourage believers. He's telling them that, hey, everyone around you that's of the world is gonna go on prospering in and of the things of the world. You will be persecuted, you will be reviled for your faith, you'll be made fun of, you'll be shut off, you'll not be spoken to, you will not be liked because of your faith. But Christian, hold fast and trust that all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for you 
for your teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. It is going to teach you how to walk hand in hand with your Savior, how to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. Because if you're a follower of Christ and you've been born again, the Holy Spirit that dwells within you is going to reveal the truth of who God is, that he's rich in mercy, that he's loving, that he's gentle, that he came and he sent his son to save you. And all this is found in scripture. Something else is found in scripture. By reading scripture and focusing on the truth, you'll be able to identify and see when things ain't right. Okay, you'll be able to identify and see when things are not of God. And you'll know to turn and run. Or maybe you'll know to share the gospel in that moment. So, the name of the series is Be Different. And what I don't want you to think is that you could be different in your own power or merit. No one has the ability to do that. I don't have the ability to be a better version. I don't have the ability to be different just because I want to be different. The only way we can be different is if the truth abides in us and we in it. And the truth is Jesus. He is a person. The truth is a person. And if he abides in you and you in him, he will cause you to be different. And here's something that's really important for the the 12-year-old to the 100-year-old. All ages in between. What you consume and what you feast on and what you put into your mind and your heart and your brain is going to control the way that you react and your actions and the way you respond. And if it is things of the world, it's gonna be really hard for you to respond or act the way that Christ would have you to do so. But for the Christian who's not perfect in the room and still falls, if you're spending your time wanting to know God more and longing for him to change you and longing for him to glorify himself through you, then there's a very good chance that he's going to do that. But you have to consume his word. To know what? To know who he is and his attributes and to be able to spot what's not of him. So we're in apologetics on Sunday mornings and I would encourage you as we wrap up this Sunday morning with apologetics, to continue studying apologetics and memorize 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, because it's important. All right, welcome to week three. We're just getting started. 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17. John writes, he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So verse 15 would be like 15a and 15b. 15A is this side and 15B is this side. The verse should, it could be split and written in the original language into two things, right? So first, we have to ask the question. We have to address it. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Does anybody know what John's talking about? It's okay if you do or don't. I had to research. I had to dig and, and study. I knew, but I wanted to know for sure. So John says, do not love the world or the things in the world. What is he talking about? What world is he talking about? Is he talking about God's creation? Is he talking about what God created or the animals or humans or any of of those things? No, he's not. Because scripture itself tells us that God through his creation glorifies himself and shows his excellencies. So God's, or, or John's not disagreeing with God. He's not disagreeing with God. He's not saying you should hate the earth and people and animals and everything else. He's not saying that. He's not saying not to love that. You absolutely should love that. He's not saying that what God created in in Genesis and said was good that you should not love. It's not what he's saying. Yes, sin severed us, but God obviously 
loved us enough to send his son to die for us. So John's not saying, hey, don't, don't love people. Zach's gonna preach more on this next week, but, but, but John is specifically talking about an evil spiritual, or a spiritual system of evil that is governed by Satan. John is talking about the ways and the lifestyles of the world that are contrary to the word of God and what God says is right. John's saying, do not love that. Paul speaks of this as well in Ephesians 2, verse two. He says, you, he's, he's, he's uh, writing this letter to the Christians at the church of Ephesus. And he tells him, he says, you formerly walked according to the course of this world. Same spiritual system of evil governed by Satan. This is the same language here. And Paul is just emphasizing it, or John was emphasizing it. Saying, you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Later in this letter of 1 John, John writes, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So the ways and the teachings of the world or the lifestyles and ways of teachings of the world not found in God's word or warned against in God's word are not from God, they're from Satan, okay? And here's what I don't want you to think. Satan is not always some, some big old guy running around with horns on his head wearing all red, okay? Jesus said that in the last days, and we've been in the last days since he ascended into heaven, that in the last days, false teachers and false witnesses would come out and perform all kinds of signs and wonders to maybe even make or try to persuade the elect to go astray. So he's not just talking about, about pure evil that we can see and know. He's talking about false teachers, anything that is not of God. And I'm about to share a story with you. People, places, and things are irrelevant. This happened to me a couple days ago. But in your walk with Christ, if you're living a life for Jesus and you're pursuing Jesus, and you're going places to share the love of Jesus, you're going to come against opposition. You're going to come against opposition. I experienced something earlier this week that was exactly that. Two people walk into an area that I'm at where I'm ministering to someone, and they're holding some type of book that looks like a Bible, and they begin saying what they would call prayer, and they begin doing it really loud to be seen by everyone that's around and they never once mention the name of Jesus, not once. And then they go on to announce that they're gonna speak in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14, if you wanna know about that, read that. They go, they go on to announce they're going to speak in tongues and cast something out of someone who they have no clue who they're even talking to. So I, being, my, being me, step away and pray and ask God, what would you have me to do right now? And by the power of the Holy Spirit, not because Chase is educated, not because I know a lot, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God gave me the words to say, and I was fortunate and enough and had the opportunity to rebuke them, to share the gospel with them, and to tell them that what they were doing was not of God, it was of the enemy. And you will face opposition, I promise you. You will, if you go on mission to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will face opposition. You will face opposition. And John is simply telling you here that there's a world that you can't see that's working against you to try and defeat you, but you can't be defeated, Christian. Nothing can defeat you if you're in Christ. So in order to know what to say or how to react to people in love and gentleness, focus on the truth of who God is. That's why 2 Timothy is so relevant. All scripture is breathed out by God. My child, do not love the world or the things of this world. So, Jesus actually spoke to this as well. So, John speaks to it, Paul speaks to it. I got to experience it two days ago. And Jesus speaks to it. The same language that Jesus uses in John 15, 18, 
The very same language is the same language that Paul was using in Ephesians 2, verse 2, in the same language that John is writing in 1 John. Jesus says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. I can tell you that when, when I had the encounter, I could see the hatred in the person's eyes towards me. And Jesus is saying, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. And the second half of this verse means exactly what it says. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. There's no like room for speculation. The reality is that a born again Christian who has God's seed abiding them in them, if God dwells in you, you will not love the things that he does not love. In 16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. John's talking about sin. He gives specific sin, but we have to have a little moment here, okay? We have, we have, to, we have to be okay with having a biblical view of what sin is. It's not just a mistake. It's not just, oh, I messed up. Sin is breaking God's law. It is spitting in the face of your creator. I do it. You do it. We all need saving from it, but sin is lawlessness, Sin is absolute lawlessness and it completely and totally cuts us off from a living God. And I'm not telling you that to condemn you. I'm telling you that because I love you and I'm telling you that because Jesus sent his son to rescue from that reality, to rescue you from that reality, me from that reality, anyone who would repent and believe in him from the reality that you are cut off from a living God due to your sin. And, and the reality is this, is that sin to the sinner is fun. It's just a part of who they are. It's a way of life for them. Their eyes are blinded to the things of God. But, but hopefully the majority in this room, you know, for you, you've been awakened to the truth. And the sin in your life, you deal with it by throwing yourself at the feet of Jesus and crying out to him and trusting that his blood is enough to cover it. Because anything apart from that is not salvation. And the specific sins that John lists here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna address them because they're in this, this passage of scripture. He says, the desires of the flesh. So he's clearly talking about sexual, uh, sexual temptation. We just finished a series on that like a month ago. He's clearly talking about that, but it's not limited to that, okay? The desires of the eyes. Here's what's cool about your eyes. Your eyes let light in. Your eyes let you see beautiful things. Like if you, who's been to the beach, right? Who likes the beach? I, I can't stand it, but it's, a, it's pretty in the morning when the sun's rising. I'd rather go to the mountains. Anyways, you've been to the beach and you're watching the sunrise. Your eyes allow you to see the beauty in the sunrise. But the enemy in the ways of this world will use your eyes as an instrument to let temptation in if you're not focused on the truth. That's what John's saying here. Your eyes aren't evil, but the world you live in is. And it's under the influence of the evil one, according to 1 John. And our eyes, they, they, they cause us to indulge in idolatry. They cause us to want what everyone else has. I fall into this. They cause us to long for more and miss the contentment that is found only in Christ. and the pride of life. The arrogance or boastfulness that you could create some perfect life for yourself apart from Jesus. In our flesh, we're wired to think that we could work hard enough and obtain enough to find or have or keep happiness. But you who are born again know that this isn't true and you, and you, and you know this and this is spoken of in verse 17. He's saying this, the world, everything in it, even the schemes of the devil is all passing away. 
And one day, when Jesus returns and restores everything back to himself, saw a video earlier today, side note, this just came into my head, from Genesis, the words of Matt Chandler, all the way to Revelation, God is pointing us to, hey, I love you and I'm reconciling the world to myself. And that's what John's saying here. This is all gonna pass away. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. As Harrison comes back up, I don't, I don't want you to hear that the will of God for you is anything other than repentance and belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That is his will, that you would be reconciled to him by believing and looking on the cross. I've shared this story before to y'all. I've shared this story in Celebrate Recovery. I share this story, I think, every three months. This is so impactful. Al, excuse me, Alistair Bag, a great pastor, was preaching a sermon to a lot of pastors in seminary school. And he told them, he said, when you're preaching, make sure that everything you preach points back to the gospel because without the gospel, we have nothing. We have no hope. When we fall, the gospel is our hope. When we stumble, the gospel is our hope. When we sin, the gospel is our hope. When we're overcome with depression or anxiety, the gospel is our hope. And I've shared this story before and it gets me so fired up. He said, he looks out at the crowd and he said, I would love to be there. I would love, I would have loved to have been there when the thief on the cross walked into heaven. Huh. He's like, I would have loved to have been there when the thief on the cross walked into, the, into heaven. Because whoever the angel is at the front gate would have been like, hey man, what did you do to get in? Did you go to Bible study? Did you attend church? Did you read the Bible enough? Did you pray? Did you do these things? And the guy would be like, no, I didn't do any of that. Well, did you, did you, did you go out and feed the homeless? Did you go on a mission trip? Did you do any of these things? He's like, no, I didn't do any of that. But I recognized, I recognized the son of God and he said I could come. I recognized the man on the middle cross and he said I could come in. The ways of the world are never gonna lead you to that type of hope. They're not for you, but if you're in Christ, your God is for you. And if you're not in Christ tonight, the offer on the table is simple. Repent and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Find someone, find a leader, find a friend, find, find whoever brought you. Pull him to the side. Ask them to show you in scripture what it means to repent and believe. And trust, and trust that. You don't need the power to save yourself. You don't need the right words to save yourself. That God and his son has put on display his power and his righteousness to save the sinner, that he who knew no sin became sin so that we may become the righteousness of God. Jesus, the Christ, he's the answer. Father God in heaven, I pray tonight, God, I trust you're drawing someone. God, maybe you're drawing a wayward son or daughter who's trying to fight you and run for you from you. Maybe God, you're drawing them to repentance. Maybe they've believed, they believed in your gospel for salvation. But God, maybe tonight you've opened their eyes to the, to the truth that you want them to pursue holiness. God, I pray for the other person in the room that I know you're drawing, that doesn't know you, that's far from you, that's cut off from you, that, that that thinks because of their sin, there's no way you could love them. God, I pray you awaken them tonight, that you would awaken them, you would awaken their soul to the love of Jesus Christ, and that you would meet them right where they're at. And it's in his name we pray, amen.
You 
It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you. Do not let what we heard tonight go to go to waste. Let it sit heavy on our hearts and our minds. God, let this let your spirit move as we go to small groups. God, I ask that you don't stop moving now that the songs are over, now that the message is over, God. Give us boldness to speak in group and talk about you, to open up and seek what you, what you have for us tonight. We love you, Lord. Amen.